collaborative work. And I, I said to Amy, look, I can come over to Canada and meet your meet your guys and we can and gals and whoever or we can have a chat and we can do lots of things together. And that was great. Well of course that's gone by the by now, hasn't it? You can't do any of that. So we were talking and we decided we'd share our thoughts with you for what they're worth. Um, we don't want to tell you we're not asking the question what ITE should seek. We're asking the question what should ITE seek. So we're, we're hoping to pose some questions for you and just start a debate. And we would love for this debate to continue between Scotland and Canada in particular. And, and uh, uh, we, we should say a, a big hello to our Canadian colleagues who are joining us at 9.30 in the morning. Heavens mm -hmm. listening to me at 9.30 in the morning must be hell for anybody. Um, I mean, I mean my, my kids tell me it, it's hell at any time of the day. Um, so, and also, um, to anybody else from around the world who's joining us, welcome and, and, and happy whatever, whatever time of the day it is for you there. I, I don't know. Um, so I think the first thing to, to, to say is that when we initially had a chat, Amy and I, we, we came to the conclusion that notwithstanding the fact that there's a, a, a reasonable Scottish diaspora in, in Canada, we, we came to the conclusion that actually in terms of Alberta and in terms of Scotland, there's a lot of similarities really apart from the size of course i mean that alberta's huge and scotland is relatively large it, it, within the uk but it's not that big um and, and we were talking and saying well actually we, we, you know we have we have a lot of the, the the similar issues um a lot of the similar things we we need to share so you know in scotland we have a very densely populated central belt and, and, and it's more sparsely populated in the border region with england and, and, and really quite sparsely populated in the Highlands and islands, and, and that brings with it its own challenges with regard to education, healthcare, all, all sorts of things. I mean, Amy, do you want to do you want to say anything there? Yeah, and can, and actually, I will say Canada, and not just Alberta, uh, does share this similar kind of population pattern, which does impact teacher education. So when we think about Alberta in particular, we have a very densely populated central belt and it's actually in Alberta follows uh, one particular highway that goes uh, basically from Lethbridge in the south up to Edmonton. Um, but we have a huge northern region in, in our province uh, that takes up basically half of our province. And this northern region is very sparsely populated and very, very difficult. Um, for those school divisions that are located in that area to be able to recruit and retain teachers. This has shaped uh, teacher education in this province and actually in the country. As we uh, do have a northern population, um, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut um, that have massive land area and very few people. And I mean, we have a similar situation in Scotland, notwithstanding the, the, the size, in that it is more difficult to recruit in, in some areas in Scotland than it is in others. And there are incentives from the Scottish government to try and attract people in, into these different um, regions. But, but it, is, it is true to say that it, it is more problematic and, and, and it does impact on teacher education and impacts on, on teachers' access to continuous professional learning uh, and things. So, there are a number of, of different um, activities that have gone on in Scotland to try and address this. I won't, I won't talk about them now, but I mean, they might come up in, in the uh, discussion afterwards. But I think suffice to say that, you know, Alberta, Canada and, and Scotland, we, we, we share some, some similarities in the, the challenges we face. And, and, we, and we thought on that basis, it might be interesting to begin to explore some of those and, and, and think about the, the ways in which we can learn from each other and and perhaps support each other in, in some of these um, developments. And the one thing that we, we started with was, um, well, we started thinking about the, the idea of, of uh, teacher learning, teacher professionalism. And, and the one thing that I, I came back to and pointed, pointed out to Amy was, we had a, a review of uh, teacher learning way back in, in 2010. It was published in 2011, as, as quaintly known as the, the Donaldson Review. But the, the literature review prior to that um, from Mentor et al talked about four different types of teacher. And I mean, the, the thing that they pointed out is that all you, we can see all of these at, at all of the time in, in various situations. And I, I, if memory serves me correctly, there was no judgments made about the, uh, the um, 
the positives or negatives of each particular one in terms of one being better than the other. It, it was pointing out that, you know, teacher professionalism is something which isn't, which isn't one thing. It's a variety of things and, and, and it's positioned in a, in a variety of ways. And, and what was interesting about the review was that it said that, you know, no one teacher perhaps necessarily always adopts one of these particular positions. They might flip between positions, they might move between positions. Um, as their career unfolds or as their experiences unfold, etc. Um, so we started from, from that particular, particular view and, and we also started from some theoretical work I'd done on, on policy um, and the way in which we might come to understand policy and, and there in my paper in 2016 I, I talked about the idea that we have political frames that give rise to particular positions for understanding social, cultural, political matters, which in turn uh, position uh, attempts to explain policy, legislation, mandates and that sort of thing. But that actually what we get are, is policy formed at the local level. So through an individual uh, conversation or through groups talking to each other, what happens is that at, at local levels, be that within a local authority, be it within a province, be it within a school or whatever, people will form particular policy positions. And what we want to talk about today is this bit in the middle, this kind of realm of, of explanation and how perhaps what we see with policy explanations, policy mandates, legislation, et cetera, is the way in which it, it try, it, way in which it tries to get us to think in one way, but, but actually, in some cases is in dangerous in danger of making us think in another way and, and pushing us in another direction and we wanted to kind of explore that with you and, and, and perhaps start a debate about how that might be the case in in canada and in and, and in scotland so um and and, and here amy, amy would you would you like to say anything about the um the, the political part in because i know you've got a particular position in Alberta that's perhaps different to the to the wider Canadian perspective mm -hmm. politically. Absolutely. So uh, first of all, it's important to know if, if you don't already that um, due to the size of Canada, uh, you know, many, many years ago, it was decided that education would be a provincial under a provincial umbrella. So our education system is not um, it's not mandated federally with the exception of our indigenous peoples, uh, it's mandated provincially, which means that each provincial government that comes in plays a really strong role in how education is both uh, seen and interpreted by the public. Um, generally in Canada, we tend to have uh, a fairly liberal, um, you know, central to left of center uh, political leaning. Um, this, however, is not generally the case in Alberta. So in Alberta, we uh, tend to see more conservative governments. And we are currently, um, we are currently with a very conservative government. So uh, this would be, um, it's called the United Conservative Party, and it is a very right of center party. Um, because of this, what we're seeing is a view of education and a view of teacher education that is heavily based in metrics that um, is strongly tied to standardization and to testing. Um, but what's important to note is that this is not the case all across the country. Um, so in our neighbors to the west uh, in British Columbia, we see less of this. Um, and so education and the way it's experienced by students, by parents, by teacher educators, by teachers is very different from province to province. So in Alberta and potentially now at Ontario, we have uh, quite conservative, um, more metrics based standardized views of education uh, being it, you know, being put out through the government. Uh, otherwise tends to be more liberal. So I think that's a really important distinction because uh, in a country this large, it really can vary um, the sensibilities, the ways in which people uh, um, come to education uh, through government policy can change quite significantly from space to space. Um, 
and I think it's fair to say in in Scotland we we have a, a probably a, a left leaning orientation in terms of education and in terms of many social structures and, and social experiences as well. That's not to say that governments don't get wrapped up with the idea of PISA and wrapped up with the idea of league tables and, and that sort of thing. But, but generally, I suppose we have a, a more left leaning orientation, but, but we do have at the moment a, a, a Scottish Parliament uh, run by a, a minority Scottish National Party uh, with support from the Green Party. And, and, and often what we see, in my view, and this is my particular view, is we see a we see opposition to things that the SNP put out coalescing around the idea of independence rather than coalescing around the idea of left and right. So what we we see occasionally is Labour and, and the Tories having a similar line of attack. So we see the Conservatives and we see the left and the right wing Conservatives and the left and Labour Party having a, uh, a similar line of attack against the SNP because of the SNP stance on independence. Now that's not always the case. And there are differences between left and right, but it, it seems to be that we we we, we have, um, in some respects, got an orientation which is about um, uh, unionism, i.e., staying within the UK and national, what's often called nationalism, breaking away from the UK, and and that gives us a certain uh, resonance in Scotland for the kind of things that we want to undertake and the kind of things that we we want to achieve in education. But not only with that political uh, matter. We've also got the fact that um, everybody, nearly everybody in society will have been to school, so nearly everybody will have a, a personal experience of education and they will bring with them those experiences and, and either unconsciously or consciously they will come to the conclusion that a good teacher looks like this and a bad teacher looks like that. And, and you know, we can't get away from that because everybody will, will, will form an opinion. I, I think, I think the, you know, Damien, I think the, the problems there happen when politicians begin to use personal experience in order to, to frame good and bad, right and wrong, that sort of thing. So in England, for example, there's been a great debate about um, increasing the number of grammar schools because many people in the Tory party went through the grammarian system. So in their view, that's the best system to have. So there was a big push in 2010 to open more grammar schools. And, and, and it's that personal experience and personal ideology that can be quite helpful sometimes in trying to get our students to think about education and the role of the teacher more broadly. But it can also be problematic when we see politicians or we see uh, people in positions of authority actually using that personal experience to demonstrate that, you know, what they think is, is right. And and, and there we can turn to research, but that's not entirely unproblematic itself in that we can say that in, in many cases, what, what we want is, is evidence-based policy. But quite honestly, often what we get, get is policy-based evidence. And, and it's that, uh, and it's those nuances that, that sometimes mean that we end up valuing particular views of research or politicians at, the, at least end up valuing particular views of research. Of, of, and indeed other, other people in education, which includes a particular way of, of understanding the, the tensions and the debates that, that happen within education more broadly. So I suppose all of this, uh, and Amy and I were thinking about this, is it provides for ways of speaking and viewing the world of, of teacher education and also initial teacher education. And we, we can't get away from all of these things that, that, come, that come together and clash up against each other in, in many respects. And, and can be very helpful at times and actually can be very problematic at times as well. So um, I think in, in, in terms of um, learning teaching, I'll, I'll just briefly give you the situation in Scotland and, and Amy can briefly give you the situation in Calgary, but, but in, in, in Scotland we can broadly, broadly um, delineate between two routes in, into teaching. Um, we, we've got four-year BA courses where you there's subject study and professional studies and practicum wrapped up within a four-year degree, a BA degree. And we can, we can talk about a, a predominantly a one-year PGDE course. Now, there are other postgraduate courses. Um, I mean, Aileen, uh, my, my good friend and colleague Aileen Kennedy runs a, a two-year master's course at Edinburgh, along, along with her colleague Emma White. So there are variations, but, but in the main, what we have are, are those two partic particular routes into teaching. Um, Amy, do you want to say a bit about how? Yeah, and so I think the major distinction between Scotland and 
the, all of Canada, this would not just be Alberta, but this would be all of Canada, is that in Canada, a, a, an education degree is an undergraduate degree entirely. Um, the master's level is the next level, but you must have the undergraduate level to be a teacher. So if you want to teach um, in the kindergarten to grade 12 system, you must have the, this undergraduate degree, a bachelor of education. And at the University of Calgary, for example, we have many routes into it. So we, have, we also have a four year bachelor of education degree, which would be quite similar to the four year BA that's offered in, in Scotland. Uh, but after that, we have a two year, what we call after degree. So if someone was to come to us with a bachelor of arts, they could then do a two year bachelor of education, but it is another undergraduate degree. So it's not a, at the graduate level. And we also have a five year concurrent degree, which means you can do both degrees, a BA and a BED or a BSc and a BED uh, in five years which is a, a condensed version of, uh, of those degrees. And what's interesting, I think, and, and speaks to learning teaching is um, the fact that to become a classroom teacher, this Bachelor of Education must be attained. Um, the Masters of Education, so similar to the PGDE, the Masters of Education comes afterwards once you are already um, through that undergraduate degree. So um, it's interesting because this Bachelor of Education has been privileged in many ways um, as being the route to becoming a teacher. So I mean, what we, we don't seem to have in either um, jurisdiction is, is the, the kind of things they have in England, school-centered initial teacher training as they call it, or school direct where people go into schools and they learn on the job in schools. We seem to have initial teacher education that's that's located in, in universities but working in partnership with, with other organizations and so there's some similarities there and, and I guess what we have there are, are different ways of, of kind of approaching the, the initial teacher education matter but but what we um, what we both uh, uh, thought about was it was I, I, I used to use uh, uh, the work of Smith and Laslett from 1993 on, on uh, classroom organization and they have this particular mantra which is get them in get them out get on with it get on with them and it was and it was uh, and, and the students loved it it was a, it was a way of kind of compartmentalizing and orientating and orienting what, what they needed to do and it was a way of thinking about transitions and thinking about theory and practice related together and it struck me that when i was talking to amy that it, perhaps this is a, a metaphor for understanding initial teacher education in terms of the way in which policy positions us in the way in which policy explanations seek to position us. Um, and and in, in as much as policy seeks to get students into to ITE, it seeks to get them out of ITE and into the workforce. It, it, it seeks to, to get us to get on with it and, and it seeks us to, to get on with them. So we wanted to kind of explore that with you. And, and quickly to say um, that there's a lot of similarity um, between Scotland and Calgary in that you know, we both have targets to meet government mandated targets, provincially mandated targets. We have expectations from the university as to who should come on courses. We have a particular application process which looks at grades from, from school, which looks at interviews or depending on different situations. And I, I guess the, the, the probably the, the challenge that most of us face when we're uh, working with um, people applying to university courses is, is this is the way in which we kind of balance the, the idea that on the one hand, they need to be able to enter the workforce and they need to be able to enter teaching. So there needs to be an, a sense of, of reinforcing the values of education. But at the same time, we also want them to kind of challenge the norm. We want them to break the mold. We want them to, to push forward and, and, and do different things. And there's a, it, it, it struck us that maybe there's a, a, a tension there. And it would be interesting how, to hear how people manage that tension uh, um, and, and, and do that. Amy, do you want to say anything then? Yeah, for us to, um, the reason you'll see there's a number of things there and it says depending. And that is because one of the things that we uh, do have in Alberta in particular, but also in other provinces, is we have a vast range of sizes of programs. Uh, so we have programs um, that take in, uh, you know, five, six, seven hundred students a year. And we have programs that take in 30. Uh, and so as you can imagine, the getting them in feels very different when we are discussing a program of 30, uh, at, you know, 30 to be accepted, 
versus uh, 5,000 applications for say, uh, you know, 800 spots or something like that. Uh, and I actually think that this plays a really important critical role that's been overlooked in many cases um, around challenging the norms. Because of course, the bigger the program gets, the more we reply on, we, we actually, um, we're stuck to those grades. And, and so by taking the top 1% um, of the GPAs that apply, the grade point averages that apply, I really think actually in many ways you are, you know, at least I feel in, in our institution, we are reinforcing a particular kind of norm uh, as, as it comes to education. And so that's why we, we put depends there because we do have such a large range of sizes of programs. Yeah, and I think people, I mean, on the PGDE at Strat 5 we have, I think it's about 900 students um, with different um, uh, cohorts, some doing secondary subjects, some doing primary. So um, there's a, the, the same kind of tensions there in, in, in interviewing and, and group tasks and all sorts of things. And we have a particular way in which we, uh, and, and I guess all the institutions will have this as well, a particular way of selecting students. Um, and it is interesting that the way that we, in some senses, go down that kind of uh, the norm, as it were, uh, and we rely on things which perhaps privilege a particular uh, type of student or particular orientation. But it's also interesting the way in which some of our colleagues will, will challenge that. And I know there are colleagues at Strathclyde and, and in other universities around Scotland who will challenge that, and who will want to challenge the norm, and who, who, who will actually say, I don't particularly, you know, I'm not particularly looking for the tradi traditional type of student. I'm looking for somebody who's going to break the mold. So, and it'd be interesting to hear how, how people manage this in, in terms of the, the kind of policy mandates and, and the pressures that, that we have. But, but I also think we have um, this idea of we need to get them out and we need to get them you know, out of initial teacher education and in, into, into schools. So in, in Scotland, we have standards for provisional registration that are mandated by the General Teaching Council for Scotland, which are, which are being re revamped as we, as, as we talk. But, but also, there's an element of school recognition in that, in that for a, a, a student teacher to pass their practicum and for a student teacher to meet the standards for provisional registration, there has to be input from the school. So there has to be recognition from the school that what they've done is appropriate or, or whatever. We've also got issues around graduate employment rates that are pressures from the UK government that are placed on universities that say, well, you need to be ensuring that your graduates are getting jobs and what are you doing to ensure that? Now in Scotland, we, we have a, a bit of a different situation because if, if students wish, they can, once they finish their ITE, they can enter into the teacher induction scheme, which guarantees them a place in a local authority school, should they desire that, which, which in a sense then skews the graduate employment rates. Um, but then once they finish their probation year, then they enter into the same kind of competitive environment that other, other teachers enter into. Um, but in terms of, of, of get them out as well, we, we, we have to ensure that we maintain school, local authority and university relationships and partnerships. And, and, and courses in Scotland are built on partnership. And, and we're very proud of the fact that they're built on partnership. But also what we uh, are, uh, desire to see on courses across Scotland is this idea of, of moving people into postgraduate study, either moving them on from their BA or moving them on from their uh, professional graduate diploma of education where they get master's credits and moving them into a kind of top-up situation where they top up to a master's. And that engagement with PG study is something that, that exercises a lot of us in uh, university. I mean, I've just given up the, the post of director of postgraduate tours at Strathclyde and that was one of the big targets I had was to convert PGDE students into master's students who are, who are going to top up. And we also have government initiatives to, to do that as well. Amy, do you want to say a bit about Calgary? Yes, absolutely. So you'll see that the two systems are very, very similar. Um, you know, there are stand we have a teaching quality standard that all of our teachers in kindergarten to grade 12 need to meet. Uh, we have, you know, uh, in, within our program, we also have school recognition, so assessments that our schools provide. Um, and partnerships are incredibly important to the work that we do as teacher educators. I think the difference uh, that we are a about to experience <laughs> is that um, 
with this new government that uh, I spoke of earlier, we are about to move to a system of performance-based metrics, which, um, uh, which will be tied to funding uh, at the post-secondary level. And so that is going to change the narrative and the, the sort of the discussions that we have, um, because now, of course, our funding will be dependent upon some of those metrics. Uh, another difference that we have is we do not have an induction year. So when our students graduate, there is uh, no guaranteed position at the end of the degree. Um, our students are, um, they're out in the world and they, they apply for positions with everybody else. So with teachers who have experience, for example, uh, there is no set uh, road for them into the profession. They, they must apply and be competitive in that way. Um, and also, it would be unlikely, uh, not unlikely, it is less common for our students to move directly into graduate work. So for the vast majority of Bachelor of Education students across our, our, across our province, um, the goal is to move into a teaching position, uh, which would then move them to the alumni office of whatever institution that they're with. But uh, eventually, so we always look, you know, three to five years down the road, eventually our goal is to bring them back to do masters and perhaps doctoral level work but that wouldn't necessarily happen immediately uh, instead they become an alumni of the university that they're at and that in and of itself um, is a whole particular narrative that is developed uh, around what it means to belong to that family at that university so as you can see there are there are slight differences perhaps the induction year being the biggest one uh, but the getting them out is equally as important. And uh, one of the things that I know we'll be facing very shortly will be completion rates. And not just completion, but completion in time. Thanks, Amy. Um, one thing I'll, I'll share with you, uh, I'm a co-principal investigator with, with Aileen Kennedy on the Measuring Quality in Initial Teacher Education project, the MQUIET project, which is looking at initial teacher education across the whole of Scotland and involves all of the institutions of higher education that undertake initial teacher education. Um, and, and this is something that we, we, we've done. We, we uh, surveyed uh, students as they finished their ITE course, and we surveyed them one year later when they'd done their um, induction year. And, and I just want to draw your attention uh, probably to the last um, number, the, the last line on the slide. And that's that th there's a, a rather large drop in the number of uh, post induction year um, teachers saying they would like to continue or they intend to undertake a master's or a doctorate. Um, it's quite, it's reasonably high um, at the end of um, qualification, but it dips quite considerably at the end of the induction year. Um, quite why that happens, we don't know, and there are questions to ask, and we are, we are asking those questions, but we just, I just thought that was an interesting. Um, uh, statistic to, to put up uh, and, and perhaps therefore capturing them when they're in their first year or of teaching is a, is a good thing to do um, because capturing them later on might be that they're less inclined to, to come back. I, mean, I don't know that's, that's something that's a discussion. And, and Amy, this is, this is your... Uh... Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have similar, um, similar statistics. Uh, in 2017, for example, the ATA conducted a study of 135 new teachers um, that confirmed a similar career progression for new Alberta teachers to that of the rest of Canada. So approximately 75% of graduates enter the profession, the K-12 teaching profession upon graduation. The issue that we have in Canada, and I don't think that it is um, limited to Canada, is that we do have an attrition rate of approximately 30 to 40% within the first five years. Uh, this is an area that we have been working with um, for a very long time. Uh, and it, it appears to be a number that is very difficult to shift. Yeah, I mean, we, we have, I mean, I, I don't know what our attrition rate is, but we have similar concerns about people leaving within the first five years. Um, and, and, and if we think about the get on, get them in, get them out, get on with it, we, we, we I mean, people will, will know about this. this. This is nothing new. And I don't think we need to draw a distinction, particularly between Scotland and Alberta. But, you know, we have a, a number of, of, of pressures uh, within initial teacher education that we have to grapple with as, as teacher educators. And indeed, we have to grapple with these when we're doing um, career-long professional learning as well. We, we have to think about the ways in which we get 
teachers and, and student teachers to think about the interface between perhaps technical and, and professional matters, for example, if, if we can de describe things in those ways. And we've also got all sorts of different things that are wrapped up in there. And, and quite often what we get in, in, in there is, is a, um, a sense of, well, particular groups, particular people will have a particular view of what the it is when you're getting on with it. So in England, for example, in 2010, Michael Gove, the then Secretary of State for Education, was, was absolutely clear that teaching is a craft and you need to learn how to control a class, plan a lesson, assess, those sorts of things, and that's it, that's what you need. We take a much more nuanced view in Scotland and a much more informed view than in that. But still we have these tensions that we need to, um, that we need to deal with. Um, and, and, and it's the same in, in Alberta, I guess, I guess I mean, you know, I mean, we, we talked about this and there was nothing really that was, that, that was different in, in, in any way, shape or form, any way, shape or form there. Um, and, and, and in terms of get on with them, it, it's kind of an interesting one because we have official measures of what we might call contentment uh, from students. And as we have a national student survey where every single student who's done a degree will be offered the chance to fill in the NSS survey. And that NSS survey is the, 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 the results are then given to universities and it's then broken down into into um, into schools of education, it's broken down into subjects, and it's broken down into, into degrees, into particular courses. And, you know, courses will be red flagged and courses will be green flagged. And, and if you're a red flag course, woe betide you, you know, you need to sort yourself out. You need to you need to get up the rankings. You need to improve the quality of your course, according to the NSS survey. And, and you know, you will produce a, 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 an action plan that demonstrates how you are going to do that. Um, and we've also, but, but wrapped up with that, we, we, you know, we've got challenges of, of both supporting and challenging students. And we, and we have a very fine balance, uh, balancing act. And I guess we have that when we're school teachers, I guess that we have that when we're graduate teachers and all sorts of things. But, we, you know, we have to engage students in, in both support and we have to challenge them as well. And, and how do we manage that? And get a good NSS score. And, and we have to think about the provision that they're offered on practical. So the support they get from their mentors in school and the support they get from regents in school and the support they get from their class teachers in school and the support they get from their university. How is that wrapped up in a, in a practical experience? And then also we have to think about the progression from when they start their course to the end and have they made sufficient progression. So we, we have all these things which are essentially policy issues uh, bearing down on us and getting us and, 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 and making us kind of think in particular ways or, or at least be mindful of, of particular things. Um, Amy, do you want to talk about the um, NSS? Sure. It's, the, really, the, the similarities were striking when we talked about this between Scotland and um, not just Alberta, but Canada. Uh, we also have a survey that all of our students fill out. Um, and, and this survey is very much around contentment. So it was, you know, it's very much around the how, how did you like this? Um, you know, did you enjoy uh, this particular aspect of your university experience um, and that is it's a very important survey and because of it uh, we do walk this fine line between supporting their um, supporting students in their attainment of whatever credential it is that they are looking for but also challenging and then how far do you push uh, to challenge before it starts to show up on a contentment score somewhere and and so it's that fine line of of walking between someone's um, sort of uh, emotional response to something that they're doing in university uh, and their academic response to the same thing. Um, and, and and so when we were thinking about about this, Amy and I were kind of wrestling with, and this isn't a new thing that we're, we're putting up here by any sense of the imagination, but we, we were wrestling with this, this idea that on, on the one hand, many of us, indeed most of us, are probably trying to prepare students for a, a professional journey. But on the other hand, there's a sense of, of, of do other people, and, and does policy, want us to prepare them for employment? Now there's a tension there between those two things. Um, you know, preparation for employment implies the here and now, whereas preparation for a professional journey it implies something which is yet to come um, and, and actually could take a variety of different paths. 
So there's a there's a tension there in the policy, and there's a tension there in in what I suppose we're we're trying to do in initial teacher education. And we can look to other countries um, and the way that they have squarely located initial teacher education as initial teacher training and as preparation for employment. Um, and we like to think in Scotland that we prepare them for a professional journey. Um, I, I guess, I mean, I, 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 I suppose that's what we, we try and do. And I, I, I'm pretty sure my colleagues would agree with me. But there's that tension there, that, and, and how does that play out? And how are we going to how are we going to manage that tension in, in a sense? And just as, a, as an example, I've got these, these two quotes from the end of, um, from the uh, end of placement survey, end of ITE survey. And these are, no, and these are by no means indicative of what everybody said. I, I put them up because they, they speak to that challenge of, of professional journey and, in, and, and preparation for employment. They speak to that, uh, uh, conflict that we actually have where the students are saying well at university you're telling us to be this kind of person whereas when we get into school we're told this is how we do it here this is what this is what you will do and get on and do it so I mean this is by no means uh, indicative of every single student but it does bring to mind the particular challenges that some of these students face and that we actually face as teacher educators and actually school-based teacher educators face as well in trying to uh, mediate between these, these different um, challenges. And in the University of Calgary, if we, uh, we do similar kinds of exit surveys and I just thought that this was very telling because, you know, when we talk about what you wish you had more of in a program, overwhelmingly it's classroom management and more time in the field. Uh, which speaks to the same kinds of sensibilities that the quotes um, Paul just put up do. Uh, interestingly enough, um, at the Workland School of Education, we don't, we don't teach classroom management as a course. Uh, we, we talk about engagement and we talk about inclusive classrooms. Uh, so the very fact that, um, that students were able to still link to that term means that it's coming in somewhere. And so uh, I, I just thought that this spoke very nicely to the fact that we, we see the same kinds of things. Again, not every student, uh, but we see those same sort of uh, draws to professional, um, to being ready, you know, to being ready to survive in the profession as opposed to the journey. Um, so I guess what we're, we're, we're trying to put teeth out here is, is this, idea that, that actually we, we, we share a lot of similar concerns and similar tensions and similar debates and similar ideals as well. And I suppose if, if what we want is to develop career-long professional learning, then in a sense we have to go back to that question, what can ITU achieve? And how does that relate to a, a connected and well-developed workforce? But also, we, we have to acknowledge the tensions between ITE and, and, and actually the tensions within ITE and also the tensions between ITE and later teacher education phases. And so therefore, how might ITE be oriented? And, and we've got to, we, we, really, it's, it's that kind of debate that I think we, we need to have a little bit more of. And, and it would be really interesting to have that between Canada and, and, and Scotland. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I suppose what we're saying is, at the end of the day, we, we've done a kind of descriptive thing for you, but there's a normative question here about how ITE should be located. And at the, at the one level, uh, should it be located as a contest to simplistic evidence-based policy or policy-based evidence? And should it be, you know, understanding the contingent nature of policy and the contingent nature of teaching? So, you know, what might ITE achieve? How, how can we kind of tease this out and, and how can we begin to orient an argument and orient a discussion which, which moves us forward that can be shared by everybody in the debate uh, school teachers local authorities provincial government national government ITE tutors in, in, in HEIs and things like that now we, we, we couldn't do this at this particular time without putting up the, the COVID slide could we <laughs> but the, the the question here I suppose is that what we're seeing now are 
changes to provision as a result of reduced practicum time and, and, and as a result of reduced time on course. And we're seeing new ways of working and we're seeing changes to those sorts of things. And in Scotland, we're certainly seeing those implications carried over into the first year of teaching and government thinking, well, if, if students have had a have had their practicum curtailed by so many weeks on their ITE course, what are the implications for the induction year? Um, but the question there, I think we should ask ourselves, is those changes, are they solely changes that we need to do as a result of COVID? Or are they actually good in and of themselves? And will they actually make for better initial teacher education? And one of the things that Amy and I talked about was this fact that at one level, we want a seamless transition from, from student to uh, uh, stu uh, teacher seeking licence or seeking uh, um, standards before registration. But at the same time, what we actually see sometimes is a rupture. We actually see a, a kind of closing down of, of the student position and, a, and an opening up of the teacher position. And we wonder, um, and we wonder whether what we, we need to think about is a more seamless way of moving from one to the other. Uh, and whether what we're actually seeing are, are, are ruptures to the journey and, and uh, situations and, and, and moments where people are, are completing something and starting something else, rather than thinking, I, I started back there as an, as an undergraduate or a PGDE or whatever, and there's this kind of seamless move through what we're doing. Amy, do you want to do you want to say anything else? No, I think I think that that covers it. Um, I do think that uh, the provision of an induction year, we too have um, a certain amount of time before uh, a teacher is able to receive what's called a continuing teaching license. So they start off on an interim, and then they get to a continuing. But but the the lack of an induction year, I think, exacerbates this idea of seamless transition versus rupture because uh, students who graduate from teacher education programs in Canada, um, because there isn't that ability to be placed automatically because they are essentially competing for these jobs um, right away, there is a sense of having to prove yourself immediately. And so um, this idea of seamless transition versus rupture, um, I think for Canada is, is an incredibly important discussion that needs to continue. And I'll finish on a, on a note. What, what's interesting is that um, England, that has uh, moved greatly towards school-centred initial teacher training, in certain regions in England, is now extending its NQT from period from one year to two years. Now, whether that's as a result of we realise that school-centred stuff isn't good enough, or whether that's a result of we just know that people need longer to get into this, I, I don't know. I have no idea. But it's interesting that a, a country that has moved away from the idea of teaching as professionally focused towards teaching as craft focused in, in much of its policy. I'm not saying ITE tutors, I'm not, I'm not saying people in school have necessarily moved away from that, but in policy terms, is actually seeking to extend the induction period uh, and, and give um, uh, new teachers longer to become part of the profession. And, I, I, and, and that struck me when I, when I read it. Myself. So there's a, a um, so the conclusions are, I mean, you can read the conclusions for yourself, I, I, won't, I won't go through them, but probably three things that I think we come out of this for us is, is this idea of the relationship between practicum, induction, professionally licensed, that kind of area. The idea of professional partnerships and what they look like and, and how we manage those. And, 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 and there are many people who've, who've done much more work with, than, than Amy and I have done this. And then, of course, there's this theory practice thing that well, just doesn't go away and, and, and is kind of there and have always been there and will be there. So I think we need, uh, it, it's, a, it's a matter of thinking through some of these uh, questions. Um, and there's some references for you. And thank you. Thank you very much, Paul and Amy. Um, we really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, I'm just aware, looking at the time. Um, Sorry, have we run over? No, you're okay. What I'll do is because we're a bit late starting, so it's 25 past five now. We'll extend the session into about for till about sort of 20 to six, quarter to six, um, so that. But if people need to leave, please leave. 
uh, don't that that's fine we've got questions and um, so we can take any questions so i'm just having a look on the chat if you've got any questions you want to share please put them in do i stop sharing now Nicola? um yeah <laughs> yeah you can do that yeah and um, everybody can, can see i'm going to start by just picking up on a point that you raised and was also raised in the chat during your presentation it was talking about that that um maintaining that link beyond the um, beyond initial teacher education and I know Amy you talked about the, the sort of alumni aspect and Paul we talked about the induction year but then it's interesting coming up on the chat I know Andrina and Stuart uh, were talking about this and saying you know what happens past that and that kind of drop off for the probation our teachers in Scotland have had that support and then that goes and also the universities seem to in, in the Scottish context certainly seem to lose contact um, with students but it's interesting as you said Paul with the Covid situation there's talk of the universities being more involved in that kind of support mm -hmm. um, but whether that that's a, that's possible for universities given all of the aspects around that. Mm. What are your thoughts, both of you? And it might be interesting, Amy, to hear more about the alumni aspect that you were talking about there. Yes, so um, that's a it's an interesting point. And in actual fact, some of the work that we've been doing, at, I'll, I'll speak to the Workland School of Education specifically uh, in this case, but some of the work that we've been doing is really to try and find a bridge across that, uh, you know, the end of the degree uh, to the start of the teaching degree. Um, for many of our early career teachers, it's actually a provincial teaching organization called the Alberta Teachers Association uh, that steps in at that point to look, to, to take care of things like um, uh, professional learning and, and those sorts of things, although schools do provide that as well. But we've been looking at a way to extend our reach out into the profession. Uh, the alumni office is, um, it, it doesn't play this role. So the alumni office, what it does is it connects our students back to the university in a way, you know, that is um, more familial. So, you know, you, you convocated from the University of Calgary, you'll always be one of us. It's one of these, <laughs> one of these kinds of things, but it, it doesn't extend necessarily um, anything uh, beyond perhaps networking, which can be very important. Um, but it's not exactly a professional learning path, let's say. Yeah. Um, it, in many cases, it is a way to remain connected with people, which is, as I said, important, but it's, it's not a professional learning path. I do think that that is something, the ability of universities to extend their reach out into the profession over those first one or two years uh, is something that we really do need to continue looking at here in, in uh, Calgary in particular. Thanks, Amy. Paul, anything more to add there? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, um, I mean, for me, the, the, the issue is, uh, I mean, I don't know quite how universities are involved in the induction. Um, I mean, I, I chat to colleagues of mine and, 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 and their view is universities aren't, aren't particularly involved in, in the induction. Uh, now, I don't know whether that, that's true or not, and I don't know whether it's true for every course and every university across Scotland. I mean, that's something we, 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 we will get round to looking at in the MQI project, but it strikes me that, that um, what we're seeking to do in the induction year is, is to have a, a, more, uh, a more gentle introduction into teaching, and I think that's right, and, and I think that's a, a good thing to do. But I think we all, I think we all, all, ought to, to recognise that, that when you get a, a position as a teacher in your induction year, you know, you are a teacher. You know, if you're primary, you're given class. If you're secondary, you're given classes to do. And yes, you're given extra support, and yes, you're given extra guidance, and yes, you, the LEA, will, the, the local authority, sorry, will provide uh, resources for you and, and will provide support for you. But to all intents and purposes, you know, you, you are, a, in, in many respects, a teacher. You might not have full registration, but, you, you know, you, you, you get in there and you act like a teacher and you work like a teacher. Now, at one level, that's not a problem. But at another, another level, you know, do, do we need something else? But, it, but in terms of, of master's work, we, we did a great deal of work at, at Strathclyde of offering our PGDE students who do, at the moment, do 80 credits towards um, uh, a master's course. 
we offered them uh, bursaries so that they could get free modules to, 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 if, they, if they said they were top up to a full master's. So we kept a lot of our, um, we kept about, about 50 to 60, no, about, about 60 of our 800, 900 um, PGD students came back and continued their studies. And indeed, the MQuite data um, seems to demonstrate that we've got quite a high desire to come back and study at Stockpile. Now, whether that translates into study or whether that translates into students, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't do that work anymore, so I'm not privy to the, to the numbers. But it, it does strike me that we need a, a better relationship between universities and, and schools and local authorities. And I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm not saying anybody's to blame and I'm not saying it's a problem. I just think we, we, we need to all of us work, work a little bit harder in that. Um, there is partnership money that comes from the government for, for local partnerships. So we have the West Partnership in, in Glasgow, and money is given to Glasgow University and Strathclyde University for us to deliver M-level modules to teachers, and that's managed by the, by the nine local authorities, and they decide on the teachers that go through to us. So there is that support there, and there is that link there. Perhaps we need more of that, I don't know. Um, you know, perhaps it's something we need, we need to think, we need to think further on, but yeah, so. Yeah, thanks Paul. Patricia, you raised your hand there. Do you want to come in? Have you got a question or comment you'd like to make? Sure. Um, hi everyone, I'm Patricia, also from Workland, and I work very closely with Amy on several projects. And I was just thinking about those, those quotes from the students, Paul, that you shared about uh, saying that, you know, they were kind of told to forget everything they learned at the university and to do it this way instead. And I know some of the research that we've done, Amy and I, um, we found that, that schools often look to, to the students um, to teach them new techniques or, or new approaches. And we're, we, we're finding this specifically with the, our um, TQS number five, which asks uh, that schools implement uh, Indigenous perspectives. Mm -hmm. So the, the teachers are, are saying that um, they rely on our students mm -hmm. to share their knowledge and, and what they've learned at the university. And I'm just wondering, do you find that also happening in Scotland? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, certainly. I mean, what I presented was, was probably unfair in, in as much as, I, you know, I mean, I did say it's not indicative of the of the, of the situation, I, I just put it up there as a, as a kind of demonstration of some of the tensions that, that students find. But certainly, many of our mentors and many of our class teachers and many of our regents in school will say, it's great having a student, it's absolutely brilliant having a student because they bring a whole new fresh perspective. And many of them will say, it's great having a probationer in school because they're energetic and they've got all these ideas and they, and they shake us up and they move us forward. Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think you know, schools can gain a great deal by getting involved in initial teacher education or having students, and they can gain a great deal by having a, somebody at the beginning of their career. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we do see that. Um, I, I, I think probably what I um, presented was a, a particular view um, from, a particular, from a particular sector section of the, of the sector, which is probably quite small, to be honest. Um, I think probably, many mentors would argue well, that's what I don't want to see I want to see students doing their own thing but I offered it as a, as a means to say well it, it's not all, all sweetness and light it's not all roses it is actually difficult for them and, and, and they are sometimes in difficult situations but no I agree with you many teachers in school relish and I used to relish working with, with students when I was a teacher it, it was it was just wonderful they would you know, they challenged me to, to up my game sometimes, you know, and that, that's really good. And, and I love that. And it, was, and it was wonderful. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I think just reflecting that there's discussion going on in the chat, really interesting about um, the idea about um, the role of the mentor and the university in supporting um, student teachers, but also teachers in their induction year and beyond. Um, and some important points and debate being raised around how are teachers, you know, Donaldson famously stated, you know, all teachers are teacher educators in our Scottish context, but how do we, you know, how does that come through? And are our teachers, you know, suitably in a position to do that supporting role and, and you know, people highlighting how, what an important role the mentor plays. Um, and interestingly, you know, I think it's interesting if we compare it to other, um, uh, 
other uh, careers such as social work where actually to be a mentor teacher in social work you need to have done a master's qualification to be able to do that mentoring role um, so what's your thoughts on that Amy and Paul around the debate that's going on on the chat there you want to kick off Amy uh, sure I <laughs> uh, there's uh, I'm sort of I'm of two minds about it um, we actually have a very common discussion uh, almost invariably every year and that is that we would we are always looking for ways to encourage our mentor teachers who mentor our pre-service teachers so our students uh, to see themselves as teacher educators and to take it up in that way so we are always looking for ways to connect those teachers back to the university in a stronger and more collegial way um, as opposed to a service role uh, which um, I think can tend to be how it's perceived. Um, where we would run into trouble, and I'll be very honest, it's a logistical issue, is um, if we required all of our teachers to have a master's degree in order to mentor a teacher, we would not have enough mentor teachers. That is simply the, the case. So um, there would be many ways that, um, that we would love to work with teachers. I don't know that we would ever go down that road only because of logistics, um, but the ways in which we uh, talk about how we get our mentor teachers to see themselves as a really integral part of the university, not just uh, that you know supervisory triad that tends to form, but actually as a member of the university uh, is a conversation that we have often and I've just been sort of following the chat here a little bit too and I agree that um, if we could manage that shift in narrative uh, I think it would I think it would actually uh, shift something uh, within ITE particularly around the uh, get on with them <laughs> part yeah. of it yeah <laughs> Amy, I know that um, colleagues I'm familiar with, Tim Hopper and um, Kathy Sanford over in Victoria, um, they, they, their teacher education program, they looked a lot at um, working with teachers actually and teacher mentors and, and, and their, their project was more sort of combining the teachers with the university and university teachers with the schools more. Is anything similar happening at your university or? Uh, well, we have, we do do something similar, but we do it um, in a, I'm going to say in a, on a smaller scale. It's not actually a smaller scale because the program is bigger. So we have some issues around scalability, for example. We're about uh, close to double the size of, of the University of Victoria, which is um, where Kathy is. Yeah. Um, what we do, however, is we have invested heavily in having uh, university facilitators that connect with a relatively small uh, group of schools. And we, we try and connect it in that very sort of personal, individual way. So on a large sort of faculty scale, not so much because we'd be talking about thousands of people. But what we try to do is connect in that more, um, yeah, in, the, in those smaller groups. Does it always work? No, it doesn't always work. Um, but that is, uh, is one of the ways that we are really trying to draw our mentor teachers into the university as a whole. Uh, we obviously, as does everyone, I think, we still have work to do. No, thanks, Amy. Um, I mean, for me, I, I, I think this is wrapped up with wider problems of uh, teacher pathways. I mean, if we think about um, t uh, somebody's career from being a, uh, a probation teacher through to the end of their career, probably what they see uh, for most of the time is they see probationer, teacher, curriculum lead or something, PT, deputy, head. Uh, and there's that kind of career mapped out for them. Now, there are alternatives to that, and there are other things they can do. They can go and work in the local authority, they can go and work in the university, they can do other things. But I, I think what we have is a, a particular um, career structure, which is reasonably, for lots of people, reasonably dull. I mean, I never wanted to be a deputy head, and I never wanted to be a head, so I had to kind of manufacture for myself something else. So I ended up in local advisory, in local authority advisory work, and then I ended up in, in higher education. Um, 
And I would urge people to look at the work of Marco Schnook uh, from one of the Amsterdam universities, I forget one, who's done work with the EU looking at, at the way in which we can conceptualize career pathways and the way in which we need to start thinking more broadly about what teachers might do and the way in which they might move through and, uh, uh, and between different pathways. And one of the pathways he's got is a teacher education pathway which doesn't necessarily mean you have to work in a university. It could mean that you work in school doing, doing teacher education, initial teacher education. But what that work talks about is, is um, having something that people can uh, latch onto and say, you know, at this particular moment in time, that's where I see my career going. And, and it gives them a, a series of, it gives them some kind of progression. Now, Donaldson talked about every teacher being a teacher educator and in an informal sense I would agree with that you know we, we all support our, uh, each other we help each other we guide each other we we you know we're a shoulder to cry on we're a we're a raised fist and a cheer when something goes well we're all doing that and that's wonderful in terms of formal structures for teacher education no I don't think every teacher should be a teacher educator I think we need to have teacher educators who have a particular understanding of, and I'm seeing in the chat, coaching mentioned quite yeah. a lot. So, and perhaps coaching is, is what we need. But I think if we are going to be serious about initial teacher education and career long professional learning, we need people who are experts in teacher pedagogy and teacher education pedagogy. And we can't just rely on the universities to do that. We, it has to be in schools as well. And I would say that what we need in Scotland is to think about a wider um, career restructuring and think about the wider implications of all of this. And instead of saying, um, well, you know, you've mentored three students in the past, you can carry on doing it. And that person might do it brilliantly. That, that's wonderful. But in other schools, and you will get this, you'll get a sense of, well, you haven't had a student for three years, it's your turn. Now, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's appropriate for the teacher to be put in that position. I don't think it's appropriate for the student either. And I think we, if we're going to be serious about this, and I think we should be serious about it, then we need to actually uh, come up with some way of uh, constructing a career pathway for people who are going to be teacher educators, wherever they might live, universities, local authorities, schools, whatever. And, and I think we need to be clear about that. And I think we in the teacher education community should be clamoring for that because we have to take it seriously. And, and most schools and most teachers will do that and they will give their all and they will do the best that they can. But when you are a mentor in school and you have one period a week free to talk to your student and you get no financial reward and you get nothing else, is that appropriate? I would say no. And I say we, we, need to, we need to rethink this. However, I pick up on Amy's point to ask everybody who does that to have a master's degree. We wouldn't get, any, we wouldn't get enough mentors. So we, we need to be creative and we need to think about this in a, in, a, in a careful way. But I come back to it formally, everybody helps everybody. Formally, no, we need yeah. to develop a career pathway for people who are going to be teacher educators in a variety of settings. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Amy. I'm going to bring the, the session to a close there, but I think that's a perfect way to close it. I'd like to thank everybody for the discussion on the chat during that, because that really picked up on the key points that you were making there, and um, Paul and Amy. And I think there is, as much as there was debate, there is a, a consensus coming through around this idea of some kind of pathway um, to support um, that, that sort of teacher education pathway where there are teachers that have that, um, that, that focus on supporting teacher education. So thank you to everybody for the chat. Thank you for every, to everybody for attending. I think, I mean, one of the key points that was raised at our executive meeting actually on Friday was that we ha we're having these great sessions and because we've got a schedule, we're moving on to something else, but it would be really great to revisit these. So um, we've got sessions coming up in June and July. We're going to take a short break in August to give everybody some time off and then we'll be back in the autumn and September. So it might be worth revisiting this um, either with Amy and Paul again or anybody who's here today if you 
think that that's something you'd like to um, move forwards with and lead on a CIRA Connects event, please get in contact um, with myself through CIRA. So thank you everybody for today. Thank you, Amy and Paul, very much. Really enjoyed the session. Um, if any of our CIRA exec want to stay on just at the end and we can have a, a debrief after the session, but um, and thank you to everybody for joining us from Canada this morning for you. <laughs> yeah. Hello to our Canadian colleagues. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. Hello, right back. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, hey, it's thank good. Thank <laughs> you, thanks for coming. And hope we can have a follow-up in the autumn with this as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.